Hello there. On this video, I'll be discussing all about network management. Okay? So or simply NM. Okay? So NM is network management. Okay, so before we proceed with the discussion, so let me cite the module objectives. So the title here is uh, network management and the objective is for you to implement protocols to manage the network so this includes um, LLDP, CDP, NTP, all right, the SNMP okay so these are just examples of tools or protocols that you can use to manage your network also includes the syslog okay so let's get started so let's start with device discovery with CDP or the Cisco Discovery Protocol. So CDP is basically a proprietary layer 2 protocol that is used to gather information about Cisco devices which share the same data link. So if Cisco devices are connected to each other okay, and you want to know what platform, what iOS or what device is connected to your interface, so you can use the Cisco Discovery Protocol or CDP. Take note that CDP is a proprietary protocol. So that means this runs only on Cisco devices. So if you are using a non-Cisco device, CDP is not appropriate for use. So we have what you call LLDP, which will be discussed later after the CDP. Okay. So the device sends periodic CDP advertisements to connected devices. So these advertisements share information about the type of device that is discovered and the name of the devices and the number and type of the interfaces. So by default on Cisco devices, CDP is enabled. So how do we configure and verify CDP? So for Cisco devices, we simply run CDP enabled. So uh, as what I'm saying, CDP is enabled by default. So if in case you disabled it intentionally for whatever purpose and you want to enable it, so the command is CDP enable. Okay. So to disable the CDP on a specific interface, so you just type in do CDP or no CDP enable. Okay. So to, to view the or verify the status of the CDP and display the information about it, so you could simply type in show CDP command. Okay. So again, CDP is basically used to discover the neighbor or to know the platform. If you have some inquiry, what devices is connected to your interface, then you can use CDP. Okay. Next, you can use also the show CDP interface command to display the interfaces that are CDP enabled on a device. So the status of each interface is also displayed. Okay, now with CDP enabled on the network, so you could use the show CDP neighbors command to determine the network layout. So as shown here in the diagram, so for instance, on R1, we issued the command show CDP neighbors. And on our G001, okay, so the device connected to it is a switch. Okay, so the capability is, this is a switch interface, all right? And the platform is WSC3560. So it's 3560 platform connected via fast Ethernet 05. All right. So that is if in case you want to determine the neighbors directly connected to R1. Okay. So the network administrator also uses the command show CDP neighbors detail to discover the IP address for switch 1. So as displayed in the output, the address of switch 1 is 192.168.1.2. You could also determine this aside from the platform, the interface. Okay, so the whole time is also there. The device ID. Okay, so you can also view the IP address. Okay, so um, that's CDP. Alright. Okay, so we have an example, or if you want to go to simulate the use of CDP, you could go ahead and packet tracer, okay, and log into Cisco Nataka and look for the activity packet tracer there. Okay, so 
So how about device discovery with LLDP? Okay. So CDP is a Cisco proprietary protocol. Again, if you are using Cisco devices, if you have implemented Cisco devices and you want to discover the neighbor on your network, we can use CDP. Now, if in case you are not using Cisco, for instance, so actually you are using a non-Cisco devices in the network or a hybrid, different brands of devices, then we can use the LLDP, okay, or the link layer discovery protocol. So it works the same way as of CDP. So LLDP is a vendor neutral neighbor discovery protocol. It works with network devices such as routers, switches, wireless LAN access points. So this protocol advertises its identity and capabilities to other devices and receives the information from the physically connected layer two device. Okay. Now, how do we configure and verify LLDP? So same thing with CDP, we have the commands LLDP run. Okay. So to enable LLDP globally on a Cisco networking devices, so we type in LLDP run. You might be asking, sir, is it compatible with Cisco device? Yes. All right. So if you are connecting your Cisco device and a non-Cisco device, so you can use LLDP. But if you know that you, your organization is using a full Cisco devices, then you can use CDP. Okay. So to disable LLDP, you can type in no LLDP run. Okay. So that is on the global configuration mode. So LLDP can be configured on specific interfaces. However, LLDP must be configured separately to transmit and receive LLDP packets. So to verify LLDP is enabled, you could type show LLDP command here. Okay. So as shown here on the figure below, so something like we are going to enable the switch for the LLDP. Okay. So to, to configure this on the specific interfaces, for instance, this is G01, all right? So LLDP transmit and then LLDP receive. So this interface is configured both to transmit and receive LLDP packets, okay? And to verify whether your device is running LLDP, you could have show LLDP here. So the status is active and then advertisements are sent every 30 seconds. So hold time, this is similar to that of a routing uh, protocol. All right. Okay, so how do we discover devices using LLDP? So in CDP, we have show CDP neighbor or show CDP neighbor details if you want to see the IP address. Now in here, we have the show LLDP neighbor. Okay, so as you can see here, so connected to our switch is a router via FA05. Okay, the hold timer is there. Capability R, that means it is a router. Okay, it's, uh, something like you've got, it is connected via G001. Okay, also connected to your switch one is switch two via FA01. Okay, the capability is bridge. Okay, and then that's via FA01. Okay. Next. So um, when more details about the neighbors are needed, so you can use the show LLDP neighbor detail command that can provide information such as neighbor iOS version, IP address, and device capability, just like CCD, uh, CDP neighbor detail. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the next uh, protocol that we can use uh, systems admin or network administrator. So that is NTP. NTP stands for the network time protocol. Okay. Now time is basically an important thing in a computer network. So we want everything to be synchronized in time. Okay. So the software clock on a router or switch starts when the system boots. So it is the primary source of time for the system. So it is important to synchronize the time across all the devices on the network. So you can use a server, for instance, you are running an Active Directory and you are using Windows Server 2019. You could also get the time from your server. But 
if you want to get the time or the source of the time would be your router and switchers that would also be possible okay so typically the date and time settings on a router or switch can be set using one of the two methods so you can manually configure the time and the date so as shown in this example okay so if you'll observe here on router one we manually configured clock set we've got 2036 november 15 2019 okay so that would be november 15 so this is the time here system six clock update so you've got these notifications okay so we'll be dealing with this later on as we discuss this lag okay so this is a system lag okay now as network grows it becomes difficult to ensure that infrastructure devices are operating with a synchronous time using the manual method okay so that is why we want to have a better solution to configure the ntp over the network so this protocol ntp allows routers on the network to synchronize their time with the ntp server so we'll have or we will going to assign an ntp server that would be the source of the time of all the devices connected over the infrastructure Okay, so this provides more consistent time settings. So NTP can set up to synchronize a private master clock or it can synchronize to a publicly available NTP server on the internet. So NTP uses a UDP port 123, okay, and it is documented on the RFC 1305. Okay, now, what's the importance of having it? For instance, you are using an active directory and you are um, deploying a policy over the infrastructure, for instance, just like in the university all right so for example your laboratory started at 12 okay to 4 30 for example okay so if you try to log in before 12 o'clock so you will be denied okay or if you try to log in at 12 o'clock but it's on a different day so you will not be allowed also okay so that's how important time is on the network or if you are uh, monitoring the lags on the infrastructure or on your network, time is very important. All right. So how do NTP works? So NTP networks use a hierarchical, okay, uh, hierarchical system of time resources. So basically at stratum zero, this is where the source of the time is. Okay. So each level is the, uh, in this hierarchical system is called stratum okay so the, the stratum level is defined as the number of hop counts from the authoritative source okay in this case this is our authoritative source at stratum zero so the synchronized time is distributed across the network using the protocol called network time protocol okay so the maximum hop count is 15 so stratum 16 which is the lowest stratum level indicates that the device is unsynchronized okay so j j just like the rip okay or the rip protocol okay so that's beyond um, 15 hops so that would be unreachable so in this case if we are using an ntp okay and if you are using stratum 16 that means the time there is already unsynchronized okay now so what this level mean stratum 1 two three and the zero okay so for stratum zero this authoritative time sources are high precision timekeeping devices assumed to be accurate with a little or no delay associated with them so stratum one these are devices that are directly connected to the authoritative time sources as what you can see here okay so stratum one is directly connected to authoritative time sources okay so they act as the primary network time standard okay so stratum two three four five and so on or lower so stratum two servers are connected to stratum one devices so as what we can as what we see earlier this is in hierarchical nature okay so stratum two is directly connected to stratum one through network connections okay so stratum 2 devices such as ntp clients synchronize their time by using the ntp packets from stratum 1 server so they could also act as server for the stratum 3 
devices. So going back again on the diagram. Okay, so this stratum 2 devices here gets time from the stratum 1. Okay, and stratum 2 devices can act as a server on those devices on stratum 3. Okay, but devices on the same level can use, uh, can use the neighbor, okay, as reference for verification on the time settings. Okay, so that's why you'll have this the bidirectional arrow within the same stratum okay so time servers in the same stratum level can be configured to act as peer with other time servers on the same stratum level for backup or verification of time okay so as network administrator it is very important for us to set the time within our domain or our infrastructure so before NTP is configured in the network, so you could go ahead and type something like show clock command to display the current time. Okay, and evaluate if that time is updated or evaluate if the time is manually configured or you are implementing the NTP. All right, now with the detail option here, as you can see here on R1, it was executed show clock detail. Okay, so the detail option Notice that the time source is the user con user configuration. Okay, so if you will observe or if you still remember, we have manually set the time earlier on the earlier slide. Okay, so that means time source is user configuration. So that means with this um, note here, that means the time on this router, router one, was manually configured by the end user or by the administrator maybe. Okay. Now, the NTP server IP address command is issued in a global configuration mode to configure 209.165.200.225 as the NTP server for R1. Okay, so if you are going to um, imagine the connections of R1, R1 is connected to a time source having an IP address of 209.165.200.225. So if you are going to let this R1 get its time from the NTP server, so we could simply type in NTP server, then the IP address of the source. So which is 209.165.200.225. Okay. So when you execute or execute the command show clock detail here, the first time you run it, the source is a user configuration. So after setting up the NTP server, it says here now that the time source is an NTP. Okay. So that means R1 is getting time from the time source or the clock source which is at 205 or 209 165 200 at 225 okay you could also do the same on other devices on the network provided they are on the same level or same stratum with that of r1 okay next so configure and verify the ntp so the show ntp associations and the show NTP status commands are used to verify that R1 is synchronized with the NTP server 209.165.200.225. So you can have show NTP associations. Okay, so as you can see here, so we are associated with 209.165.200.225, okay, stratum 1. Okay, now with the show NTP status on R1, so since we are connected to stratum 1, so therefore R1 is in stratum 2. And the clock is synchronized. Okay, with reference to 209.165.200.225. Okay. Next. So, for instance, we are connecting switch 1 to R1. So, switch 1 here is now on stratum 3. Right? So, switch 1 will be in stratum 3 because we are connecting it to R1. And we, we make use of R1 as our server. So on the switch one, you could go ahead and type in NTP server 192.168.1.1, which is the R1. Okay. Now, when you have the shown NTP associations, so you'll see there. Okay. So you have associated the switch one to 192.168.1.1, which is R1 at stratum 2. So when you have the show NTP status, this is now stratum 3 and the clock is synchronized. 
So if you will observe also here, you've got the reference clock here. So this is the time source. Okay, so via 192.168.1.1, this router 1 gets its time from 209.165.200.225. Okay, so see, all the devices on the network can be synchronized to have the same time. All right. Okay, so let's move on and discuss the next tool or protocol that is or that can be used in network management. So that is SNMP or the simple network management protocol. Okay, so SNMP was developed to allow administrators to manage nodes on the IP network. So it enables network administrators to monitor and manage network performance, find and solve network problems, and plan for network growth. Okay. So, in network management, basically, SNMP is used for the implementation of what you call FCAPS framework. Okay, so FCAPS stands for Fault Management, Configuration Management. So, this one is Fault, con uh, fault Management, Configuration Management, Accounting Management, Performance Management, and Security Management. These five areas here, available on the FCAPS framework, defines network management. And they uses, or it uses, SNMP to carry the data from the source to destination. So SNMP is an application layer protocol that provides a message format for communication between the managers and the agents. Now, what are these managers and agents? So in network management, agents are any devices that you manage. So we call it MO or managed objects. Okay. So it includes a routers, a switch, a server, a workstation, a firewall, any device that you tend to manage or monitor is what you call an agent. Okay. Or it has an agent on it. So basically an agent is a function that gathers information from the managed object or managed node so in manage in network management we call it managed object or mos all right now the manager here or the snp manager is basically the application that receives data from the managed object via the agent okay so manager is an application also that receives data from the agent which is also an application or an operating system of the device okay so you've got the SNMP manager and the agent. Now, the third component of the SNMP is the MIB or the management information base. So basically, this is a logical storage or a logical database for all the managed objects. So we, we, we configure host names, something like the IP address. Okay, so something like the it generates a routing table. All of this information are stored on the database called MIB or the management information base. Okay, so SNMP uses UDP port 162. Okay, so that is for the manager and for the agent, it uses port 161. Okay, so SNMP manager is part of a network management system or NMS. The SNMP manager collects information from the SNMP agent using the get action command and can change configurations on the agent by using the set action command okay so we have commands like get and set okay these snmp commands are being used by the manager okay so to get data and collect data from the agent okay so we have here different mo's or managed node okay so this includes router switch and a firewall okay now within these devices we have what you call agent okay now on these devices ios which is the operating systems of these devices serves as an agent so basically an agent collects information or data from the local device and then that data is transmitted to the manager upon request or then the, the agent might be notifying the manager if there is a need via SNMP. So SNMP is just a carrier of the data from the managed object 
going to the manager. So that is where SNMP resides. It's between the agent and the manager or it's, it's on the network basically. Okay. Now, how about traps? What is a trap? Trap is unsolicited messages from the agent. Okay. So we call it unsolicited because the agent basically notifies the manager if something is wrong with the network. Okay. So when the manager wants to get data or to set values on the managed object, we call it polling. All right. So we call it polling. Polling is an action initiated by the SNMP manager. Okay. And then this trap here, okay, is a notification coming from the agent going to the manager. The manager is not actually asking for it, but the agent tends to notify the manager. This is what you call event reporting. Okay. So event reporting. Now, what's the difference between polling and event reporting? Aside from the fact that in polling, this action is initiated by the manager going to the agent. And event reporting is that the agent notifies the manager. So let me cite an example. When you say polling, if the, ad if the network administrator wants to view the routing table, for instance, on this device, okay, we want to get the routing table here. So basically, the manager will get or will use the get command to get that routing table from the agent okay so something like on the on the cli we want to type in show ip route okay so again show ip route all the show commands basically are example of polling because the action is initiated by the manager show me this show me that all right so all show commands are example of polling okay so show ip route show CDP neighbor, show CDP neighbor details, show LLDP, all of it are polling because the action is initiated by the manager. Now, event reporting, for instance, if the interface of the router, interface serial 0 slash 0 slash 1 goes down, so you are being notified via your PuTTY or the hyper terminal, via your CLI, right? So that is an example of event reporting. We are not actually asking for a device to notify us, but the devices are automatically notifying us. That's what you call event reporting. All right. So I guess we're clear on that. Next, SNMP operations. So from the diagram presented earlier, we have the get, set, and the trap command. So basically, the complete list of commands are here. So there are two primary SNMP manager requests. Okay, so which are get and set. In addition to configuration, a set can cause an action to occur like restarting the router. Okay, so get request retrieves a value from specific uh, variable. Get next request retrieves a value from a variable within the same table. All right, so the SNMP manager does not need to know the exact variable name. So a sequential search is performed to find the needed value from within the table. You also have the get bulk request. So retrieves large blocks of data, such as multiple rows in a table that would otherwise require the retransmission or the transmission of many small blocks of data. So this only works on SNMP version 2 or later. So we will, uh, we will be covering the different versions of SNMP later on this discussion. You also have get response replies to a get request and get next request is a get response okay so also this is a reply to the set request okay and then set request stores a value in a specific variable so you might not be aware that you are using snmp the mere fact that you can control the devices the mere fact that you can monitor and connect to the devices you are using actually an snmp or a simple network management protocol okay so the SNMP agent responds to SNMP manager requests as follows. So for instance, you'll have the get an MIB variable. Okay. So the SNMP agent performs this function and responds to a get request PDU from the network managers. For instance, here, like my example earlier, no? I want to see or to check the routing table. Okay. 
So in this example, I want to check the MIB variable to find out if G000 is up. So this is show IP interface brief, right? So that is an example of SNMP get. So this is an example of polling. Okay. Or we want to set the host name of a router. So that is set an MIB variable. Okay. Next. So we also have mentioned agent traps earlier. Okay. Something like the G00 interface failed. Take a look. So this is a notification coming from the agent going to the manager. And this is what you called event reporting. All right, so we have three versions of SNMP, version 1, version 2, and version 3, okay? So version 1 is a legacy standard defined in RFC or Request for Comment 1157. It uses a simple community string based authentication method. Should not be used due to security risks, okay? So um, currently, we are using SNMP version 2C and version 3, okay? They have the same functionality. They only differ in terms of security implementation. All right. So version 2C is defined in RFC 1901 to 1908. Uses a simple community string based authentication method also. But it provides bulk retrieval options as well for more detailed error messages. Now, SNMP version 3 is same with that of the previous uh, versions. It uses username authentication, provides data protection using the HMAC MD5 or HMAC SHA, and encryption using DES, 3DES, AES encryption. So the only difference is the security. Okay, Version 1 and version 2C uses a simple community string-based authentication. And this is in plain text. Whereas SNMP version 3 now equips with encryption. All right. So basically, SNMP version 3 is more secure than the previous releases. Okay? Now, we kept on mentioning community strings earlier. Now, version 1 and version 2C basically uses community strings that control access to the MIB. So community strings are plain text passwords. SNMP community strings authenticate access to the MIB objects. All right? So there are two types of community strings. You've got the read-only and the read-write. So read-only, well, as the name implies, this is a read-only. You can, you can only read it, all right? So that's your only access. Because security is minimal in version 2C, many organizations use SNMP version 2C in read-only mode, all right? So what is read-write? Read-write is full access. It's just like an administrator having an access to everything. Okay, so we call it read write or full access. Okay, so next is the MIB object ID. Okay, so the MIB organizes variables hierarchically. Okay, and formally, the MIB defines each variable as an object ID or OID. OID uniquely identify managed objects. The MIB organizes the OIDs based on the RFC standards into a hierarchy of OIDs usually shown as a tree. That is basically based on the RFC 1213. Okay, so that we will be dealing with network management or systems network administration if you get there. Okay, so the MIB tree for any given device includes some branches uh, with variables common to many networking devices and some branches with variables specific to that device or vendor. So RFCs define some common public variables. Most, de uh, most devices implement these MIB variables. So in addition, networking equipment vendors like Cisco can define their own private branches of the tree to accommodate new variables specific to their devices. Okay, so this is the hierarchy or the tree that we're talking about. All right, so this is the MIB organization wherein everything started with an ISO, org, DOD, internet. So if we are going to get the OID of the internet, okay, so the OID of the internet is 1.3.6.1. That's the internet. All right. So 1.3.6.1. 
Now, if we're looking for Cisco, okay, Cisco basically the OID is 1.3.6.1.4.1.9. That's Cisco. All right. So 1.3.6.1.4.1.9. So basically, this is the OID of Cisco on the SNMP. Okay, so I OIDs belonging to Cisco are numbered as follows. No? So 1.3.6.1.4.1.9 as we have typed in here. Okay, so that's how we read the OIDs on the MIB tree. And that's how they organized it. Okay, so we mentioned polling earlier. Again, polling is an action initiated by the manager. Okay, so SNMP can be used to observe CPU utilization over a period of time by polling devices. Polling meaning the, adv the, the administrator would want to get data from the devices. So something like we want to, sh to see or observe the CPU utilization on the router. So you can do that. Okay, so CPU statistics can then be compiled on the network management software or system and graph. Just like what you see on the task manager of your computer. So this creates a baseline for network administrator or a benchmark that we can use in decision making. Okay. So the data is, re uh, is retrieved via the SNMP get utility issued on the NMS. NMS could be any application. Okay. So that can receive data from the agent. Okay. Next, how about the SNMP object navigator? So, can we memorize all the OIDs on the MIB3? No. So, we have what you call the SNMP object navigator or we call it the SNMP browser or the MIB browser. Okay. So, this is basically a GUI which makes the OID easy to read. Something like you'll have this. Okay. So, you enter the OID, it will just give you the description of that OID. Alright? So, you don't have to know or you don't have to memorize 1.3.6.1. What is that? 1.3.6.1.2.1.3. and so on. Okay? So, you'll have this SNMP object navigator in Cisco. In On other brand or other uh, vendor, they call it MIB browser. Okay? And basically, it should be in the GUI, you know? So, for the ease of use. Okay, next is system logs or syslog. Okay, so syslog uses the UDP port 514 to send event notification messages across IP networks to event messages collectors as shown in the diagram here. Okay, so if you will observe, basically all MOs or managed object or all devices on the network generates logs. Okay, mostly you'll see it via your CLI. But when you see it on your CLI, it's basically residing on the local device. So when you turn off the device, so it's gone. Now in a network, okay, so if you are the network administrator, we want to record all of these lags happening on every devices. And we want to record it on a centralized location. We call it syslog server. Okay, so the syslog lagging service provides three primary functions. So the ability to gather lagging information for monitoring and troubleshooting. Okay. The ability to select the type of lagging information that is captured. And the ability to specify the destination of captured syslog messages. So we want everything on our infrastructure to be recorded. So that's why we need a syslog or system logs. Now the syslog protocol starts by sending system messages and debug output to a local lagging process. So syslog configurations may send these messages across the network to an external syslog server, okay, where they can retrieve without needing to access the actual device. So you don't know you don't need to go to, for instance, a router on the 50th floor, okay, or a router on the other building. So if you are just seated on a, a host where the administrator manages the network, so they can just use syslog. Okay, because everything is recorded there. So that's a good thing about having a syslog on the network. So alternatively, syslog messages may be sent to an internal buffer. 
which is internal buffer that's an internal storage. So messages sent to the internal buffer are only viewable through the CLI of the device. Okay, so as what you experience at the laboratory, every time you have this notification coming from the agent or coming from the devices, it just shows on the screen or on the CLI, right? So you might have the options to record it or to save it or to store it on a local storage. But it's been better if you're going to have it on a centralized repository. All right. So the network administrator may specify that only certain types of system messages are sent to various destinations. So the good thing about Syslog is that I don't have to record all the notifications coming from the devices. So I only want to record starting from this level up to this level. Okay, so you can also do that. You can customize what you want to record on your system logs. Okay, so popular destinations of the syslog messages includes the following. So lagging buffer. This is RAM inside the router or switch. Okay, you can also you see that in the console line. All right, so like what you do in the laboratory, it's on the CLI. Or it could be on the terminal line. Okay, or the best option is to record it on a syslog server. Okay, now this is the syslog message format. Okay, so it has a severity level. So if you have seen level zero, that means system is already unusable. Okay, so I have not experienced seeing level zero on notification on the screen or on the syslog. Okay, <laughs> so that system unusable. Usually level one, that's an alert. It requires an immediate action for the network administrator to pay attention. All right so level two is critical condition level three is an error so most of the time you'll see their level four warning okay notification informational these are just informational messages so these are level six and debugging if you enable the debug options on the cli you'll see level seven okay so mostly you'll find there level 4, 5, and 6 if it is merely a warning notification or informational. Okay? So, syslog facilities. In addition to specifying disparity, syslog messages also contain information on the facility. Okay? Syslog facilities are service identifiers that identify and categorize system state data for error and event message reporting so the lagging facility options that are available are specific to the networking devices so some common syslog message facilities reported on the cisco ios routers includes the ip ospf protocol sys operating systems right ip security and the interface ip okay now here's an example of the lag okay so in here you'll have here that means this is level three okay and if we go back to um, the previous slide okay so three means error okay three means error all right so what does that mean okay so link three up down interface port channel one change state to up okay so this is an error message here the link in the severity level is three with a mnemonic up down so we say up down here it could be up and down okay so we are using mnemonics when we displayed it now if you will observe there is no time all right so we've talked about ntp earlier and of course when we say lags we want it associated with time right so there should be a timestamp here. When does this event occur? What time? What date? So that's very important. Okay. So what we can do is, so by default, lag messages are not timestamp. So as network administrator, we must include timestamp. So we can use the command service timestamps lag date time to force lag events to display the date and time like what you see here. Okay. So this now includes the date and the time when the event happens. All right. So the command is service timestamps lag date time. Okay. 
Okay, so next would be router and switch file maintenance. So how do we keep the iOS? Okay, so router file systems or the iOS file system allows the administrator to navigate to different directories and list the files in a directory. So the administrator can also create subdirectories in a flash memory or on a disk. The directories available depends on the device. So you could type in the command like show file systems command, which lists all the available files on the Cisco 4021 router. So just like showing the directory here, okay? Just like doing directory command in the CMD or LS command on your shell, okay? So it displays all the lists of files available, okay? Next, router file systems. So because flash is the default file system, okay, the DIR command lists the contents of the flash. So if you want to view the files stored on a flash, we can use the command DIR, okay, or directory. Of specific interest of the last listing, there is the name of the current iOS, okay, so which is this one. That's your iOS there, okay. So basically, iOS is also a software, no? it's a file, basically, okay? Next, so to view the contents of the NVRAM, you must change the current uh, default file system using the CD or... CD means change directory. This is also the same command we use in, in DOS, right? CD, okay, means this one, like we have, we have here. So CD NVRAM, so we have to change the directory to NVRAM. PWD is the present working directory command. So this is where you're currently working, PWD. So that means we are on the NVRAM. Okay, we are currently working on the NVRAM. So when you type in DIR there, so that will display the directory or the contents of the NVRAM. All right, so this command verifies that we are viewing the NVRAM directory. So finally, the DIR command lists the contents of the NVRAM, although there are several configuration files listed. Of specific interest is the start configuration file. Okay, so what is this? Startup config. This is the file read by the router or by the switch whenever the system boot up or whenever the device boots up. This is where your configuration goes. All right, so if you are running the devices and you kept on configuring or updating it, so your configuration is actually on the running config, all right? And if you want to save that and load it once the device has started, then we have to copy run start and that goes in here, all right? Okay, so if router has a file system, switch also has a file system. So you can have show file system, okay? So same thing with the router, okay? Next is use a text file to back up your configuration. So some of you may be doing some, I'm going to have the configuration and instead of, I, I want to keep a copy of this configuration on a notepad, for instance. So you, you're just going to copy and paste the notepad and then save it. You keep it via a text file, okay? So basically what you do is you go to the configuration you might be using putty or uh, in this example is Terraterm. You copy and then paste it on the notepad and then you save it. Okay. So that's how we do it. We, we use text file to back up our configuration. Okay. You can, how to use your text file to restore to the configuration. Okay. So some of us or some of you may be using... You open the notepad, you copy it, and then you paste it on the terminal. That's also possible. Or, okay, you could uh, go ahead on the file menu, click send file, locate the file you want to send, and then click open. So in Terraterm, we'll paste the file into the device. So copy and paste. Okay. Next, you can also use TFTP to back up and restore a configuration uh, file okay so you could follow the following steps to back up the running configuration to the tftp server if you don't want to do it on a notepad or a file so instead copy run start you could have your copy run config tftp command 
enter the IP address like what you see here and then of course the configuration file will be stored on this host all right next USB ports on a Cisco router so you might be wondering what, what is that for so the USB storage feature enables certain models for Cisco routers to support the USB flash drives so the USB flash feature provides an optional secondary storage this is just an additional uh, storage capability and boot device okay so the USB ports of a Cisco 42, uh, 4321 router are shown in the figure here so you'll have the USB options or optional ports there so not all routers are equipped with such okay so that will just gives us an additional storage capacity okay so using usb to back up and restore configuration okay so uh, just have to execute something like copy running config okay so we will be storing our configuration file on the usb flash all right so uh, after this command you go ahead on the flash and then see it it's there okay next how to use usb to back up and restore so this time how do we restore it okay so to restore this so of course you have to navigate on the usb flash zero so that is directory usb flash zero you could type uh, something like uh, pwd if you really are in the directory okay and then what you can do is if you want to view more so you could do so okay now we will be using the command okay more usb flash r1 config okay this is the configuration for r1 so what will happen is that would be loaded or restored a configuration to the device okay so the assumption here is the file is r1 config so you use the command copy usb colon backslash r1 config running config to restore the running configuration or mostly what we do we copy from the notepad and paste it right but then there's other way of doing that okay all right so another um, tool that the administrator uh, must know is the password recovery and you as a student also should know this already right you have to be familiar already with how to recover password procedures something like if you have encountered problem in the lab sir i don't have the access to the router because it is password protected someone put a password on it and forgot to delete it okay you should know how to recover the password okay and to recover a password on a router is very easy you just have to go to a roman okay so passwords on the devices are used to prevent unauthorized access so for encrypted passwords such as the enabled secret passwords the passwords must be replaced after the recovery so depending on the device the detailed procedure for password recovery varies so my recommendation is you get the model of the router you go to you to um, google you type in their password recovery for this model so um, that will teach you how to get into the roman mode okay so basically most of the routers we are using control brick okay when we when we're going to reboot the router for instance okay so it's there it's currently off when you turn it on you hit control break on the keyboard all right and that will eventually lead you to roman okay so once you are now in the roman so you have to type in okay so if you are already in the roman you have to type in confred 0x2142 okay so the 2142 causes the device to ignore the startup configuration during the startup so after that you type in reset all right and then so you can now do something like uh, on step three copy the config to the running config after the device is finished issue the copy run start okay, command do not apply okay or do not enter copy running config startup config this command erases your original start configuration so basically after the reset here you can now change the password okay so you're already in okay so after that you can now save the configurations that you've made okay so enable secret 
Okay, so for the lab use, but on the production area, you can have your own secured password. Okay, and then save the configuration. That's how easy it is. Okay, so next would be the iOS image management. Okay, where do we save the iOS? Where do you back up your iOS? Okay, so you, did you save it just on your hard disk? And when you need it, you load it, right? Some are using the TFTP server as backup location. So as network grows, Cisco IOS software images and configuration files can be stored on a central TFTP server. So this helps to control the number of IOS images and the revisions to those IOS images, as well as the configuration files that must be maintained. Okay? So it is recommended that we have to have a TFTP server on our network to store the iOS and some configuration files okay so how do we do it just like saving file or configuration files using TFTP server okay so we have to ensure that the device is connected to the TFTP server so just ping the TFTP server okay so verify the image size in the flash and then copy the image to the TFTP server Okay, so as simple as that. So, for instance, you'll have this. Copy TFTP, okay, flash. Address is, for instance, this one. This is an IPv6 address. Okay, and then this is the iOS now. ISR4200 Universal K9. Okay, and then that's it. You already have copied or backed up your iOS using TFTP. Okay. Now, during startup, the bootstrap code parses the startup configuration file in the NVRAM for the boot system. Okay. So you could have something like boot system flash if it is your first time to load the iOS onto your device. So you need to boot it. So if there are no boot system commands in the configuration, the router defaults to loading the first valid Cisco iOS image in the flash and runs it. All right. So um, that ends up this video. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.